I'll start the recording, I guess. Um, lots of people have quibbles with the conventions around electrical current and movement of charge. So here's the thing. Current flows from high potential to low potential. This is just like gravitational potential energy. Rocks roll downhill, current moves from high potential to low potential. And what batteries do is create potential difference. So they, in essence, act as pumps moving rocks to the top of the hill. So we have to have a way to build that potential difference, and that's what a battery does. This is a metaphor you understand, um, because there are no tiny rocks. There's nothing really being moved to the top of the hill, but what we have is something that's creating a difference in electrical potential. That's what causes current to flow having a potential difference. Just like having a hill is what causes a rock to flow, if the landscape is flat, the rock doesn't roll. If there's no potential difference from one portion of a circuit to another, no current will flow. So there are two kinds of current. There's direct and there's alternating. How much do you know about those? How many of you have some sense of what direct current is or alternating? Okay. Okay. Alternating current is what comes out of the wall in your house or in a classroom. Alternating current is what most of our world runs on. Um, it almost didn't end up that way, but, you know, Nikola Tesla got the shaft. Um, poor Nikola Tesla. He was a genius. Um, and a geek in the truest sense of the what. Are you shaking your head? Do you have a, do you have a deep love for Nikola Tesla? Yes, we do. <gasps> Excellent! We'll have to pull up the um, oatmeal cartoon about him. So... <laughs> Um, direct current is actual flow of charge carriers. So in direct current systems, you actually have movement of charge carriers. Stuff actually flows from one point to another. In alternating current, they just go back and forth. So they alternate direction. And the frequency of vibration, now we didn't do wave stuff or we would have talked about hertz. Hertz are the number of cycles of anything per second. So we can talk about um, the number of cycles per second for, we typically talk about it with waves. Um, one cycle per second is one hertz. We talk about 60 cycles per second in um, AC current flow because that's the standard that we use in the U.S. There are different standards around the world. Um, if you travel the world, you sometimes have to use converter plugs to convert your appliances. Um, when I was a kid, because I lived in Germany, we had a hair dryer that we bought in Germany for German plugs, and every summer when we would come back to the States to visit my family, my grandparents, um, we had this little cube block with four different plugs on each side of it um, labeled, and you had to use the right one, because otherwise it didn't work, because it was built for current in Europe. Um, batteries whether it's your car battery, whether it's a lamp battery, whether it's a 9 volt or a 1.5 volt and a flashlight, those provide direct current. So you have actual um, charge carrier movement. You can, like I said, all of our appliances, all the stuff in our houses runs on alternating current and you can build a generator that will run on either. Um, direct current tends to, well, I'll stop that thought. Okay, so we've got resistance within any system, and it's, it's just like friction, but in an electrical system, it's resistance to charge movement to current. Um, the ohm is named for George Ohm, um, inventor, tinkerer, etc. We really should have a unit named. We should have a Tesla, other than the car, which, you know, I do appreciate. But anyway, um, most materials, and we'll talk about this in a second, follow this sort of basic law. This is kind of like Hooke's Law, where a couple of you had done some digging and said, well, wait, bungee cords don't follow Hooke's Law. It's nonlinear. Um, if things follow Ohm's Law, their resistance is linear, and it's a direct one volt per amp is one ohm. There are materials that are what are called non-ohmic. We won't deal with those. So you can probably figure out conductors don't have a whole lot of resistance to the flow of electricity. Con insulators do. But for, all, for most of those materials, for insulators or conductors, there is some known, calculatable, testable level of resistance. It's a constant value. When you take the number of volts that it takes to push some number of amps through it, 
it's a constant number. Those are omic materials. Um, there are non-omic materials. There are materials that change the amount of resistance in the material based on their conditions. Um, generally, regarding temperature, those are non-omic. So semiconductors are non-omic because they conduct electricity differently under different conditions. Um, things, if you've heard about superconductors, things that, where you take a material and you radically change its temperature, then you get it to conduct far more readily than it would under other circumstances. That's non-omic because it's conducting differently under different conditions. Um, the whole world that we've got Gesundheit of computers and silicone chips is based on non-omic materials. It's based on things which conduct differently under different conditions. This is to take a very thin piece of wire, coil it a bunch of times around a pencil or something. Now there's whatever we coiled it around. And try to get current to run through it. And if you've got sufficiently long wire that's sufficiently thin, you basically can't get the current through it. Um, the internal resistance of the wire over that cross section, over that length, just won't allow current to flow. So you can't light a light bulb, for instance. If we connect these ends back to a light bulb, we won't get it to light. However, if you take the same stuff and dip it in liquid nitrogen and super cool the wire, suddenly that thing lights up just fine. And that's because at those very low temperatures, you decrease resistance. Well, turns out, in general, there are some patterns to resistance. The things that affect resistance are how much material you're moving through, how big the material is, and the temperature. This is where the analogies to current and water come in real handy. So if you think about a pipe with water moving through it, the water that's moving through is the current. And the farther you have to push water through a pipe, the more of the pipe it's going to interact with, the higher the frictional force longer segments of wire are going to have higher resistance than shorter segments of wire. If you have a very large pipe, you'll have lower resistance, you'll have lower frictional force. A big piece of wire will have less resistance than a small piece of wire. So very thin wires are going to tend to have sm higher resistance because they have a smaller cross-sectional area. And the hotter something gets, the higher the resistance tends to be. Um, that's why dipping that circuit into liquid nitrogen will allow current to flow, even though, and you do this with, with wire that's about the size of a human hair, very, very, very thin wire. Um, and it works, and we've done it. If we get liquid nitrogen before you guys leave, we'll try it again. Um, and that's actually, when I talked to the guy at Lind about that, he said, oh, that's actually one of the reasons that we one of the things that we sell liquid nitrogen for is for systems like that on a larger scale, where there are um, systems where they, the entire conductive works is submerged in liquid nitrogen to get it to a temperature where it will actually conduct. Okay, it's really helpful to know how much resistance a given circuit is going to experience because we actually use resistors to control the amount of current that we see flow through something. So. We build a circuit, and we put resistors in, and that's, a, that's how we show a resistor in a circuit. And based on the size of that resistor, we control how much current goes, let's get a little light bulb here, to a given appliance. So we're going to do sample problem 19B together, and then um, practice problem 1 on 703 will be on your own. Actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and give you the way that I learned this formula, twinkle, twinkle, little star, V is equal to IR, um, which is handy. And it also gives you ver as a mnemonic, if you tend to forget. That's especially easy for you, Hannah, um, I should think. So 
we're told that we've got a steam iron with a resistance of 19 ohms and 19.0 ohms. We want to know what the current is when it's connected across a potential difference of 120 volts. So that would be standard household um, wiring in the U.S. has a 120 volt potential difference between the two um, plugs. So, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. solving for I, I equals voltage over resistance, current equals 120 volts divided by 19.0 ohms, current in the system, well, I guess I don't have to do it, it's right there, 6.32 amps, which is not, you know, not anything outrageous, fairly standard. So, these are really seriously that simple, they're three-part algebra. I'll tell you what, here's what we'll do. So number one is assigned on these. Number, that is an A, yeah, sorry. It's amps. We can do that. Um, number one on page 703 is assigned. One, two, three, four, five, six. Numbers two through six are extra credit unless you have a number of points already assigned as forwarded to you, then those are mandated for you. And what I'm going to do, and we talked about this the other day, I'm still not through the pile. I got through one more last night sitting at gymnastics. Um, if you missed that conversation, come see me. But if you look at your score for Bungie Lab, it'll either say actual score, if yours is graded yet, it'll, actually, it'll either say actual score, no advance, or it'll say X points advanced, which means I put in the score you needed and I'm figuring it out once I grade yours, or it'll say, you know, 10 points advanced, 2 points advanced, whatever. If you, if you have had points advanced to you and you don't do these, then you don't walk across the stage when they call, you know, whatever cum laude. So, two through six is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's up to seven points. Um, I had a few people who were advanced like one or two points or three points. I had one person, I think, who was advanced 15 points. So, you know, depending on how many points you were advanced, if you were advanced any points, uh, and this only applies to seniors because they're the only ones I had to have grades done for. So, um, if you had points advanced to you, you have to do all these. They are assigned to you. If you didn't have any points advanced for you, um, they are. So if there's no score in for you, you didn't have any points advanced to you. You're going to get your actual grade. But if you were somebody whose grade I had to have done at 2.30 last Friday, I went ahead and put a grade in for you, and you may or may not have gotten points advanced to you. So I'm going to try to wrap the rest of those up today so that we know. Does that make sense?